Do you ever wonder what it would be like to be a 12-year-old boy going to the California Gold Rush? Well, the book The Great Horn Spoon by Sid Fleechman describes just that. Today I'm going to be reading the first chapter of his book. So, right, let's read. So this is Jack, this is a picture of Jack. A sailing ship with two great side wheels went splashing out of Boston Harbor on a voyage around the Horn to San Francisco. Below decks, in the creaking darkness of her cargo hold, there sat 18 barrels of potatoes. Inside two barrels, side by side, there squatted two stowaways. It was not once upon a time. It was precisely the 27th day of January in the year 1849. Gold had been discovered in California in some 12 months before, and now in a rush, the gold rush was on. The good ship, the Lady Wilma, overcrowded and heavy in the water with cargo, thrashed her way to the sea. Her power wheels churned and her smokestack stained the frozen winter sky like ink. She was bound for the gold fields with 183 passengers, not counting the stowaways. Hundreds of gold seekers had been left at the dock clamoring for passage. The California fever was sweeping through the cities and towns and villages like heavy, wi- heavy heady wind. Men were bu- buying picks and shovels and trying to get from the east coast to the west as soon as possible and all at once. On the second day at sea, just after dawn, the lid rose silently off a potato barrel. Cautiously, a man raised his eyes above the rim of the barrel to look out. Slowly, he unfolded his long arms and legs. Then he stood, an elegant gentleman in a black broad cloth coat. He would be the first to admit that being folded up in a barrel with a bowler hat balanced on his knees was not the most comfortable way to travel. Now he brushed off the hat and placed it smartly on his head. He hooked a black umbrella on his arm, for he never traveled without it, and pulled on a pair of spotless white gloves. He felt nearly frozen solid, but permitted himself the most contented smile. Then he gave himself a small tap on the barrel beside him. All clear, Master Jack. Is that you, praiseworthy? came a young, muffled boy voice from the depths of the barrel. Your obedient servant, the man replied and uh, lifted the lid. There rose from the barrel a schoolboy of twelve. He had been sucking a raw potato to slake his thirst. A patch of hair fell across his forehead in a yellow scribble. He had never been so cold, hungry, or miserable in his life. On the other hand, he had never been so happy. He wouldn't have traded places with anyone. His pepper black eyes were considerably brightened with the fervor of adventure. He smelled of potatoes from head to toe. His thin nose, which was smudged, felt like an icicle, but he permitted himself a most contented smile. We made it praiseworthy, he said. We did indeed, said Master Jack. Jack gazed at the dark cargo shapes piled high around them and listened to the scrape of the sea along the wooden hill. He thought of home and Aunt Arabella and the friendly blaze in the big stone fireplace. There was no turning back now. They were on the gold fields. Hungry? asked Praiseworthy. I could eat, I guess, said Jack, who didn't want to give the impression that he had any complaints. Cold? I've been colder, I guess, said Jack, although he couldn't think when. I suggest we go see what we can be done about improving our accommodations, said Praiseworthy, tapping his bowler hat firmly in place. Shall we go? Go, Jack replied. Go where? 
He fully expected to pass the voyage below decks with the cargo. He had read dire accounts of the treatment handed out to stowaways on the ships of treat. Why, to pay our respects to the captain, said Praiseworthy. The captain? The words were very nearly caught in his throat. But it'll put us in chains, or worse. Leave that to me, said Praiseworthy with an airy lift of an eyebrow. Come along, Master Jack. Jack gathered courage from Praiseworthy's cool assurance. As far back Jack could remember, he had never known anything to ruffle Praiseworthy's calm. In his black bowler hat, his black coat, and spotless white gloves, he was easily mistaken for a professional man, a lawyer perhaps, or a young doctor. But it was nothing of the sort. Praiseworthy was a butler. He was a butler by breeding, by training, and by choice. More than once, Jack had heard Edgar Arabella say that Praiseworthy was the finest English butler in Boston. He had been with Jack's family since before Jack could remember. It seemed that there had always been a praiseworthy. The ship gave a lurch and the stowaways, gathering up their two carpet bags, picked their way through the darkened passages of the hold. Jack saw barrels of smoked fish bound for San Francisco. There were thousands of feet of lumber and enough bricks to build a hotel. He saw boxes of rifles and two brass cannons to fight off wild Indians, he supposed. And he could make out wet bundles of grape cuttings, enough to plant a vineyard. With his heart thumping, Jack followed Praiseworthy up a ship's ladder to the creaking deck above. If you want to hear the rest of the story, read By the Great Horn Spoon by Sid Fleechman. Bye for now.